Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to give you a very quick first impressions view after going hands-on two nights ago with Fujifilm's X-T3 at the official launch event in Brooklyn, home of my birth. I freaking love this camera because it let me do this. <music> First, we'll be leading our inaugural photo walk in New York City on October 6th. And we invite you to join us by going over to WorldwidePhotoWalk.com. It's free and it will be a lot of fun, I think. Link down in the show notes below. Second, if you like what you see here today, please like, subscribe, share, and support us by using the affiliate links down below. We thank you for it. Finally, if you've been watching us for a while and you actually love our work, we invite you to join us over at patreon.com slash Hugh Brownstone. So, okay, let's get into the X-T3. And let's do that by first forgetting about the specs, features, and functions for a moment or two. My friends Ted Forbes and Jordan Drake have done excellent work on that front, along with a guy I don't know and have not seen before, Kevin Mullins. Kevin spends half an hour just walking you through the X-T3 menus, and I think it's really good. I'll put links down in the show notes below to all of them. What I want to do instead is tell you what it is I think we're seeing in the X-T3. Again, full review coming soon, if we can line everything up, which is not going to be easy because we leave for Photokina in just over a week, and we are excited to bring you uh, stuff from Germany. Anyway, one with an outstanding line of crop sensor lenses. Bigger Brother X-H1, uh, Svelte Sister uh, X-Pro2, and new member of the family X-T3, never mind the other cameras in the lineup. I am convinced that as of today, September 8th, 2018, Fujifilm has the best APS-C system, mirrorless or DSLR, on the planet, period. In fact, in my estimation, Fujifilm is now one of the top three hybrid system manufacturers irrespective of sensor size. It is an exemplar of a company with a true affinity for image makers, professional and enthusiast, whose reach exceeded its grasp with the first generation X-T1, but then moved surely, steadily, to make it everything it could be. The X-T3 is a far cry from the X-T1 launched almost five years ago, a dramatic improvement over the X-T2, which began shipping two years ago to the day. And that is saying something because I loved, loved, loved the X-T2 when I reviewed it last year. I'll put a link to that review down in the show notes as well. And what's interesting is that the ergos are about the same, which is a testament to the original design because it is still, for me, the best in the business, providing the shortest distance between my intent as an image maker and execution. Two, with the X-T3, Fujifilm, I think, has just proven that you need neither full frame nor micro four thirds to essentially have it all. A spectacular combination of performance, capability, shooting experience, and value. We will be talking more about these things in the coming days. Three, with the X-T3 joining the ranks of top mirrorless cameras like Sony's a7 III and a7R III, Panasonic's GH5, GH5S, and G9 for between $200 and $1,500 less, and splitting the difference between them by, on the one hand, offering better ergonomics and value than the Sony, though not having the same low-light performance at the margin, nor the same dynamic range, nor the resolution of the a7R III, nor, I suspect, to be determined, autofocus performance at the margins. Yet, on the other hand, better autofocus, low light performance, comparable ergos, but for me, a better shooting experience than the panties, though 
not having the IBIS nor uh, flippy screens of the Panasonics, nor the unlimited recording 180 frames per second in full HD and 10 bit 422 4K recording in camera of the GH5 in particular. And now that we know much more about Nikon's Z series and Canon's EOS R with you pick it, single card slot versus two UHS 2 slots in the X-T3, 1.7 crop in the EOS R versus none in the X-T3, blah, 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 blah. It is unequivocal to me that the mantles of momentum, innovation, value, listening to the customer, acting on it, and loving image making, respecting image makers of all stripes, have shifted from traditional giants to Fuji, Sony, and Panasonic. Now, this does not mean it's all doom and gloom for Canon and Nikon. I liked the Z. I liked some things about the EOS R after going hands-on with it yesterday. And both manufacturers have the same opportunity, should be given the same opportunity, to quickly improve upon launch products. But more on that another time. Four, if you are a Canon or Nikon shooter, as I was for 40 years, thinking about going into video more heavily, as I did four years ago, and looking at the Z or R, you really do owe it to yourself to check out these other crop sensor cameras as an adjunct to the kit you already know and love. Especially the X-T3 if you're looking at the Canon EOS R. As neither has IBIS, Fuji Glass is a match to my eyes for Canon's wonderful color. And the X-T3 has superior video capabilities. The ergos are better. The ergos of the R have changed enough that there will be a learning curve for that too. The X-T3 costs one third less. The glass is generally less expensive. You get the idea. Look at the X-H1, by the way, if you're looking at the Nikon Z6. As they both have IBIS, the X-H1 feels tremendous in the hand, just like your D850. It has been sorted. And it's about $450 less. If you have the openness to contemplate Micro Four Thirds, you may be shocked by what you can get from Panasonic at the price. But we're getting ahead of ourselves yet again. And this is far from the end of that story, so please stay tuned. Uh, five. If you're a Micro Four Thirds shooter, especially a Panasonic GH5, GH5S, or G9, or you are contemplating becoming one, the X-T3 may give you pause. Think GH5S with as good or better low light performance, dramatically better autofocus, much higher resolution for stills, smaller crop, lacking only flippy screen, unlimited recording time, and 10-bit 422 internal recording for $800 less. Or think G9 without IBIS or flippy screen or OK, sub LCD panel, but better low light performance and AF, easier to reach shallow depth of field because of the smaller crop factor for $200 less, at least until midnight tonight, September 8th, at B&H Natarama. That's actually true, but I don't think there are Ginsu steak knives in the mix. And the Panasonics are great cameras. Six. Of course, this does not mean the X-T3, you know this, is perfect. The lack of IBIS is actually a bit of a showstopper for us now that we've come to rely on it regularly with our GH5. I really can't imagine life without it. But again, it just so happens that the X-H1 in-house at the moment does. So stay tuned for that review coming up too. We much prefer a flippy screen because this allows us to shoot low and look off axis, which is great for documentary work and street photography doesn't matter to us for vlogging because I don't know how to skateboard, I don't have the energy, my eyesight blows, and I actually tether uh, over here instead. We much prefer full-sized HDMI ports because they are much more reliable. The batteries are more last-generation Sony PEZ-sized capacity than the new Sony Z batteries. There's no pixel shift, but that should be no newsflash given that there's no IBIS. But after seeing how well this technology works on the Sony a7R III and the Panasonic G9, <laughs> this is an omission, keeping it from high-end product shots. But then again, that's really what something like the GFX 50S is for. Um, no dual XLR mic adapter uh, like the ones provided by Sony or Panasonic. Maybe Fuji comes up with an even smaller, less expensive solution, which would be very cool. The autofocus was actually frustrating for me the first few hours we were at the event. 
I know nothing about roller derby, uh, so I could neither predict where people would be other than that, just like a clock, they were bound to come by the same point every now and again, nor uh, until I googled and learned what a jammer is, what I should be looking for, what I should be shooting. After a couple of hours, I settled in anyway, and again started shooting my kind of shooting, as you saw at the beginning. Now these were shot at ISO 8000, 10,000, 12,800, wide open, oh my god, seven. So all things considered, at this point, on first blush, first hands on, the X-T3 is shaping up as one heck of a camera, an extraordinary camera, actually, especially at 1500 bucks. From the, okay. Let's get into it for a moment. Backside illuminated 26 megapixel X trans sensor with up to two stops improved low light sensitivity to quad core processor, which is interesting. Yeah, I like this. They're finally talking like a computer manufacturer, as in fact, in a way, they already are and need to be thinking like that. H265 wrapper for 4K up to 60 frames per second, 10 bit 420 internal or 10 bit 422 external. 120 frames per second in full HD, full zebras, 425 point phase detection autofocus with IAF even during continuous video AF, improved AF sensitivity down to minus 3 EV from 1, minus 1, 3.7 million dot EVF, the same as or similar to the ones found in the Sony A7R3 and A9, Panasonic GH5 and G9, Fuji's own XH1, and significantly better than the one in the A7 III and X-T2. I'm not just talking specs, I'm talking what I see with my own eyes. The option for linear focus motor response, oh yeah, minimizing the single most frustrating aspect of fly-by-wire lenses. No blackout, 30, 16 megapixel frames per second in sport mode. Again, splitting the difference between Sony's full frame no blackout, 20 frames per second A9, and Panasonic's micro four thirds, 30 frames per second, 6K photo mode of the GH5 and G9. A built-in headphone jack, obviating the need to purchase a battery grip the way you do for the X-T2, built-in intervalometer, a faux microprism focusing a holy Canon FTQL Batman, and more. The X-T3 is an incredibly compelling piece of kit. That's it for now. You can check pricing and availability in the show notes below. Pre-orders are now being accepted, and I've seen deals where if you order it with the battery grip with a full set of switches, you save about 100 bucks. But I will tell you this. I think Canon and Nikon just got hit from another angle, as I suspected they might be. I fear they may be even less prepared for an onslaught from crop sensor cameras than from Sony's full frame, full frontal assault. For the beginning of that story, I'll put another link into the show notes for our video entitled Canon EOS R, the one question ahead of the official announcement. Look for my comments there about the X-T3 and pricing. Yeah. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmeptreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.